comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for being here. We're so blessed it's to nice have to you here. Nice yeah, to be asked. Well, we're, we're blessed to have you here. And it's quite rare that you're even in the UK long enough to do things like this, right? Uh, yeah, I've been in um, uh, America or Canada for about eight years now, eight, eight nine years. I, I actually haven't worked in England for about 10 years. Wow. Well, we've, we definitely want to talk about that now, don't we? But I'm going to kick things off by going way back to the beginning, if you don't mind, David. I want to talk about your journey into acting and what it was that actually made you want to become an actor in the first place. Um, strange. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I was just a classroom clown. You know, I was just this, the, the, the fool at the back of the class. And... Um, I was always kind of, you know, messing around and telling jokes and making a fool of myself. And um, <clears throat> I remember in school, it was, um, you know, careers, careers week and stuff like that. And it was time to talk about what you were going to do the rest of your life. And, and I remember sitting down and people were writing down, oh, I'm going to be an accountant or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And just none of it made any sense to me. None of it really spoke to me. So... Um, <clears throat> I didn't know what I was going to do, and I, I didn't write anything down, and I was a bit lost, and um, I kind of, uh, I, you know, the teachers, I had, uh, some fantastic teachers, luckily I had some fantastic teachers, and um, I got home, and I got a phone call from one of my teachers, and he said, oh, would you come back to school, um, because I want to talk to you, so I kind of walked in to the school, and um, his, his name was Mr. Reader teacher is my English teacher and um, he sat me down and he said he said what are you gonna do when you leave and I, I said I said I really don't know I have no idea a um, little bit worried about it and he said well we've been talking in the staff room and everybody thinks you should be an actor and I kind of went what because no there weren't there really weren't many I mean there's, there's I don't, probably more now but there really were no black actors on TV when I was when I was um, growing up, so uh, it didn't. But somehow it made sense. So it wasn't even in your mind before that no, point. No, um, I, I didn't know. I hadn't read any plays. I hadn't read any. I hadn't studied acting. I hadn't done any of that. So, do you think a lot of that was due to the fact that you weren't seeing any black actors on TV? So you just didn't think it was possible for you. Until they Probably. said that. I mean, as you saw them in you saw them in American movies. Um, uh, you know, back in those days, you know, the, the black character would probably die in the first ten minutes. Um, <laughs> um, but but you know, so you'd see them in America. I, mean, I remember seeing Shaft and uh, Richard Roundtree and Shaft, and uh, I, I knew it was possible. But but um, there really when I had no British black reference points for actors. Lenny Henry had just appeared on the scene as a comedian. Uh, I remember seeing him on the program called New Faces, which was the kind of chat, talent show of the day, and and seeing him kind of, you know, making people laugh, which is what I did, and I thought, oh, maybe I could do that, you know, but um, certainly not acting. So when, when they mentioned it, for some reason, a light bulb went on in my head, and I thought, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I didn't know how to do it, so they... they wrote off to these drama schools and wrote off to these um, youth theatres and Birmingham Youth Theatre said no and then a week later uh, the National Youth Theatre said yes and I came down to London and I did a six week course at the, the National Youth Theatre and I just had an absolute ball. You know, it was the first time I'd m mixed with like-minded people like me. People who liked to mess around and they could do voices and who could play different characters and kind of make characters up and because I was always finally got to channel your energy <laughs> yeah it wasn't me messing around at the back of the class it was me messing around on stage and I found it very easy I found it um just it was natural for me to do that and I did I I, I did a six-week course there and then they said come they offered me a, a second year and at the end of my second year the uh, head of the National Youth Theatre came up to me and said you, you, you know, you, you, you've got a lot of talent, you know, you should really consider going to drama school. 
So went off to drama school and went on to uh, RADA. <laughs> but you know, I, I will say, I will say this, and this is going to be an, it's an instant injection here: uh, 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 is that although I've had, although I've had a great career, you need an enormous amount of luck, an enormous amount of luck, and I had luck straight off the bat because I got into a drama school which was not RADA which was, I later found out wasn't necessarily a great school, I'm not going to tell the name of it. Um, and because I didn't know anything about drama schools, uh, I, I, after five uh, rejections, I finally got into this, let's say, got into this drama school. So I cancelled all my remaining auditions, which unbeknownst to me, were the top five drama schools. I cancelled them all. RADA, Central, Lambda, Weber Douglas, and Guildhall cancelled them and for some unknown reason the rather letter never arrived so i'm sitting at home one day and all set off to go to this not such a good drama mediocre school. drama school <laughs> and uh, i got a phone call and they said why didn't you turn up for your audition yesterday and i immediately just lied i just i said oh my, my mum was ill and they said well you know your lucky day because um you know, we've got someone's dropped out. Would you like a, would you like a second chance? And I said, yeah. So I just went down without care in the world and uh, got into Rada. Do you think that that being such a prestigious school had a massive impact on the way your career kicked off, or do you think if you had gone to the mediocre school that <laughs> that's what I've so named it's it? Certainly, but... it's certainly. Yeah, I mean, I've, it's a, it's a great drama school, and you know, me, I got an agent straight out of drama school, and. Um, you know, as I say, back in back in the day, you know, you were it was you were quite the prized possession because I mean, before me, when I came out of drama school, there, there, I mean, I was probably the first generation amongst the first generation of kind of British-born um, black trained actors. Before me, there was you know there were some great talented actors, but they were all from like youth theatres, and I, I remember working in Stratford here with um, a group called the Posse which was a, a, a group of, way before you guys' time, but um, a group of black actors that would all come from youth theatres and, and really raw, raw talent, but funny and talented and great. And around that time in the late 80s, 90s, you know, there was an explosion of black theatre and um, an explosion of uh, the, the black voice. So there were lots of playwrights writing plays about being black in England, Sus Laws, um, uh, Stop and Search. You know, it was all, it was around the time of the Brixton riots as well. So there were lots of people writing plays about what it was like to have a black, black experience in, in England. And um, those guys had come out of that energy. So I kind of, I went a, a different route by going to drama school and learning to talk posh and... and, and were um, you the only black person in RADA at that time or was there more? Um, just you? I was no. There was another the, m me and another guy, Jude. We were the f we were the first two black actors that I think there'd been a couple of black actors that had been in the past, but of the kind of modern era, we were the first black actors that. How was that experience? There. Did you feel? I had a great time. I had a wonderful time, and and uh, again, I had a, I, I was very lucky because you know, I played King Lear in my first year. I was playing these huge, huge Shakespeare, Shakespearean roles and huge, great roles, fantastic roles. Nobody mentioned color. Nobody mentioned the fact that I was black. Probably naively, I guess, I thought I, I was going to come out and play those roles, and, and that wasn't quite the case. Um, but um, at RADA, I just had a great time. It was, it, was, uh, it, was, um, it was a great place for me to, to, to kind of grow and, and learn my craft. So tell me about when you left RADA, what happened next? What was your first professional acting experience? Uh, I had a, I, straight off the bat again. I had I was uh, I immediately okay, again. We were, we were kind of prized possessions. We were trained black actors, and I think the industry was kind of going. Oh, that's interesting. Was, so we, we were new shiny objects because because again there was this kind of you know there had been this explosion in kind of black theatre and the, as, as I say the black experience was suddenly being depicted on stage, but it was mainly being played by or it, again there were these guys who co come out of the youth theatres and there was a raw as I said, there was a raw energy to that but suddenly there was these Shakespearean you know, trained black actors coming out and the industry went oh that's nice and that's shiny 
let's have some of we'll that. Have some of that. <laughs> so I was really busy straight off the bat, and you know, always working. Never, you know, always working. What was your first job? I played Romeo. Um, you know, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it so much. I hated it, but. Um, it was fun, you know, but suddenly I was, you know, I was a professional actor. And Why was, did you hate it? I just hated it. I don't like the play and uh, I didn't see myself as, I didn't see myself as Romeo. Um, and it, it, it was my first experience of getting critiqued. And again, because we were, it was a black theatre company that was doing it. Uh, and the, the press weren't, weren't necessarily, the press hadn't caught up to the industry. So the, well, whereas the industry was like, oh, we love these new black actors. The press were like, uh, 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 as a black actor trying to do Shakespeare, right. or a black company trying to do Shakespeare. So we were kind of, it was, I remember it was quite hostile. The reception of the plays was always quite hostile, and there was always a s slight tongue in cheek. The, 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 I remember the reviews were always, it was a black version of Shakespeare. It wasn't Shakespeare. Right. It, it was a black Romeo, not Romeo. And I remember that being slightly jolting. And it was, again, it was, I think that was the first time, again, probably naive, but it was the first time I realized that I wasn't an actor, I was a black actor. And that was a very, I, that, that, uh, that really was driven home to me. Did that knock your confidence at all, yeah. or did it? Yeah. Um, that was driven home to me at, at every level. Um, that there were, these roles were for you, these roles weren't lead roles not for you these roles are for you um and it was kind of because as i say because rather i was playing everything i was playing romantic leads i was playing french farce i was doing russian plays i was doing german plays i was playing great roles but when i came out of drama school that was just off limits you were daniel kalua, kalua likes to call them the lamp roles do you know what he means by that every room needs a lamp every room, yeah did you find it that kind of experience or was it not so bad as what he's experienced kind of more now again i, I don't know i mean daniel's come out again a lot of these guys are a lot younger than me so the, the industry's changed now and um you that's know my, I, that's actually my next question how what are the biggest changes between when you started out to kind of now what do you what do you feel there, has changed there are the many most more opportunities I mean, there are, you know there are many many more opportunities for for actors now now i mean you look at john boyager and Dan, same with Jack daniel's success um you were lucky to even get an audition in you know um in my day you, you know and, and also i think the actors expectations have changed i think daniel's generation don't want to go to the rsc they want to go to hollywood you know they've got much more ambition and i think that's wonderful and really exciting that that they're not, necess not necessarily as bound as we were. America was off limits to, to us. We, that, that wasn't even possible. Why? Um, I don't know. I, mean, we, I just didn't... That path hadn't been beaten yet. Mm. I mean, for me, uh, Lenny James and Eamon Walker, the two, old, two actors, probably my generation, they were the first British-born black actors to go to America and to make a success of it. Um, uh, up until then, that wasn't that trajectory wasn't open to us. So I, I didn't. It didn't seem to be a, a a path for me. Now there's a path. Now young black actors, you know, I'm at parties in Hollywood and I cross some young kid and he goes, "Oh yeah, I grew, I grew up watching you on TV." And I think, "Wow, you know, how old are you?" He's like, "I'm 20 and at 17, 18." And it, it's amazing that these young kids are there in Hollywood because I couldn't do that when I was a kid. I didn't have the balls to do that when I was a kid. I didn't even know it was possible to do that. I didn't have the confidence to do that. And this new generation, they're, 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 they've got so much confidence and it's really inspiring to see because yeah, I'm here in Hollywood and you know, Hollywood's loving me and I'm, I'm enjoying the business, the business wants to see me and that path has now been created and it's, it's hugely exciting that that's, that's the case. I'm not saying that's the end of the story. I'm not saying it's, it's easy, but there is now, a path for young black actors from Britain to go to America, and I think that's really exciting. When was that moment for you? When did you go right? That's it. I'm I'm off. I'm off to America. I can do this. It wasn't until really late, um, and it was after I'd kind of hit a really. It was after I'd hit a, a bad a bad spell here, but um, um, I mean, Homeland was my first. You know, was my first American gig, and I I got that from. 
my bedroom in Streatham. You know, I, 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 I couldn't afford a camera. I heard you had 80 quid in the bank. I had 80... Listen, um, <laughs> you know, I can remember insufficient funds, the noise, the machine used to make those noise, insufficient funds. I remember that, you know, I was broke. And um, I just, I know, I, when I came, as I say, I, I, it's, it's an up and down story, but when I came out of drama school, I was flying, I did a lot of work and did a lot of theater and then started doing a lot of TV and, um, you know, I thought it was, this was never gonna end, but it did. And um, I suddenly found that I was no longer getting work um, when I when I got into my as a young kid you can work as a young kid you know you can play the scally and you can play the, the you know the guest lead and you can play there's a whole myriad of parts but when I got to be a man in my thirties there was nothing for me to do I think Britain has a problem with that Britain has a problem with men black men um, it doesn't know what to do with us uh, which is why we all go for the roles I mean, there's no there weren't any roles for me to play here or well, there weren't any roles that were open for me to play here mm. so I just just dropped off the map when I got into my 30s I just stopped working and um, it just so happened to coincide with the time when I would kind of uh, just bought a house and had a family and all of a sudden you're paying a mortgage and and you just are not making any money. A lot of actors talk about this. They say that, you know, they had great roles and they were making good money and they started their lives and bought the house and kind of committed to financial responsibility. And then we hear it time and time again that all of a sudden it's all just gone. Question that might be helpful to all the actors here today is, was that down to kind of money management or was that down to just thinking that it's it was never going to dry up? Is there any way that future actors can prevent falling into that situation or kind of manage it a bit better than, I, than your experience? I would say definitely manage. That's part of, part of the experience. But again, that's also part of the lessons that you have to learn in life is that, uh, is that uh, at some point, you know, the good times are going to stop. It's not always going to be, you know, going to be easy. And, you know, I remember that song, you know, sometimes it will rain. It's, you know, you, you, it's going to rain at some point. You know, the weather might be great for six weeks, but at some point it's going to rain. And you just better hope that by, when it does rain, you've put enough by to, to get by. And I'd been working. I'd been really, really busy. So I was, I was, lucky, I was lucky that I... Had, I did have something to fall on, but um, fall back on. But um, when it stops, it's scary because you can't help but take it personally, and that's not. You can't take it personally. You know, it's not down to you. It's just uh, I know that's very. It, it, that's it's very difficult to um, to 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 get to get your head around that when you're six months without work and you know signing on and I don't even know you can sign on these days but you know six months out of work and money you know, money's running thin you know it's you, you can't help but go it's all about it's it, it's the personal attack on David Harewood and it really isn't it's just that you know at some point the industry you're just not going to be in flavor at some point you're just no longer you know it was it was it was Lenny James was the big shiny thing and then then, it, then I was the big shiny thing, and then Adrian Lester was the big shiny thing, and then, and, and you know, Idris then became the big shiny. So it just passes through, and sometimes it's after that. You know, when when you're no longer the the, the big bright shiny thing, it's tough. Do you think there can only be one shiny thing at a time, David? Uh, no. Uh, or do you, you think know, it's starting to change? What's great about that last film, which I thought was fantastic, by the way, was to see Daniel and. The other guy, what's his name? Uh, Malachi. 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 To see them both working in the same on the same script, that just never happened in my day. It was either me or Lenny. It was either me or Idris. It was either me or you know. And what's great about this generation, or what seems to be happening now, is that these guys can work together. So I do think it is changing. Everything's changing. Look at this technology. I mean, this wasn't here when I was. When I, when I started out. You'll be on YouTube in about a few weeks. <laughs> no, but, but what I'm saying is it's now possible to even make a movie with one of these things. Mm -hmm. And people are doing that. There's people writing and, and, and black actors, there's, there's black people not just wanting to be actors, but wanting to be producers, wanting to be writers, wanting to be filmmakers. And that's really exciting because again, that wasn't really, we didn't really have that in my day, but it's really exciting to see this new generation of 
talented young, ki young, young kids coming up and, and really taking the industry by the horn and, and saying, I'm going to write my own film. Or I'm going to, as you were telling me, I'm going to use Instagram to get, you know, to... to he hadn't heard of Michael Dapper, so I was filling him in. I, I, yeah, I haven't <laughs> been like, here. what's just, man's not hot? <laughs> I just haven't been here, so, so I don't really know that there's a whole generation underneath me that's now using all the technology around them, all the, all the ways that they can get, get their talent out there. That's fantastic. That just wasn't wasn't there when I was when I was coming up so it's exciting that there are these other avenues for people to explore and for people to get their talent out there so you spoke a little bit about there's going to be lows um I just wanted to talk about that a little bit with you because you've been quite public in recently admitting that you've suffered with depression at times where it's been a little bit up it wasn't and the down depression. it was a side of breakdown uh, it, which was probably uh, well it was, it was to do with a lot of things but um um you know, I, I again a two year, you know, two or three years into the business, and it it just wasn't what I, what I, what I thought it was going to be. It's, I, I thought again that last film was for me seemed to be a whole parable on fame, and you think you want it, you think you can create it, he creates it, and then it just all goes horribly wrong. Um, well, that's what I got from it anyway, but. You know, I was busy at a job. I had a great time. It was all, ostensibly, I was a successful actor. But, you know, I'd come from a very stable family background to a very stable uh, drama school, uh, uh, friends and people at drama school. And then suddenly you're in the business. And suddenly you're on your own. And uh, it's kind of unforgiving. The business can be really unforgiving. And I, in what way? Because it's just you. And suddenly you haven't got those friends. And because your friends aren't maybe not as successful or your friends are still in London and you're touring in Manchester and touring in all over the country and, and I was really busy. I was never at home. So I was kind of living out of a suitcase and touring and uh setting up theatres and you know, performing these big plays and and I just found it it wasn't quite what, as I said, I didn't, it wasn't, the industry wasn't quite what I expected it to be. Some people don't like you. Some people really dislike you. They dislike you because you're famous. They dislike you because you think you're it. You think oh, you're playing the lead role, who the fuck are you? So it was the first time I'd really got a sense that people didn't like me and people didn't necessarily take to me. And it's hard to deal with that when you, you're always used to being just one of the boys and just having a bit of fun. And acting was always fun. And it, it stopped being fun. And um, I found myself... And it's really tough. I mean, again, back in those days, you'd, you literally would stay in digs, which is staying in some old lady's house in Newcastle, in some cold house, you know, and you're earning £250 a week doing playing Romeo, living in some shit place. And you suddenly go, this isn't quite what I had in mind. <laughs> you know, everyone thinks it's, it's not all, you know, that's, you know, years before, I wouldn't do that now, but, you know, but, but it wasn't quite what I expected. <laughs> and uh, it was tough. It's just a tough, you've got to keep yourself, um, you've got to keep yourself going. And it, 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 it wasn't really what I, as I say, what I expected. And, I, and it, you know, there was, there was issues with uh, uh, audiences, you know. Um, again, you were, you were, you were, this was before, uh, it's nice to come and see so many black faces in the audience tonight, tonight, but back in the day, you very, you know, you go into a theater, there wouldn't be any black audiences there. Or there'd be little pockets of black audience. And I was doing this play where, it's called Entertaining Mr. Sloan, which is a very, uh, it's, it's a very funny play, but it's, it's, when it was first produced in the 60s, it literally caused a riot. It literally caused riots in the streets because it's, it was written by a guy called Joe Orton and it's very, very sexual and very, very, very uh, dark. And um, I played the lead role in this, in this, in this thing. And Sloan, is, he's a sexual deviant. You know, he's kind of, he beat, you know, beats down the, the landlady and then he beats down the, the landlord and he's, he's playing one off against the other. And, and it's a really funny piece, but it's quite, it's quite um, uh, risky. 
and the black audiences, the black, remember the first black critic saw it, hated it, and kind of said that I should, I should, I, sh I should be careful of my the, 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 careful of my choices because I should represent the community in a far better light than I cho than I was doing, which I was was a real surprise to me. And he actually said to the people, um, he actually wrote in his review, uh, "You should go to this play and demonstrate Mr. Harewood's choice of um, uh, uh, choice and walk out, uh, walk out of the play." Uh, at this particular moment. Because I, in the start of the second half, I have this huge monologue where I come down to the stage and I start talking about sex and, and you know, having sex with this young girl. And uh, he, he obviously didn't like it. And he, he actually said to the people, that's the point you should walk out. And they did. So I'd walk on stage and for the run of the play, black audiences would get up and walk out, which started to really spin my head. Because I think that's fair. <laughs> it was, it was, and there was I kind of struggling with being a young black actor, and it was, it, and and I, I seemed to have got it wrong, and black people were not liking what I was doing, and it really started getting in my head. So I started drinking, and I started smoking weed, and before I went on stage, and it was just, it all kind of went horribly wrong, and um, yeah, ended up sectioned, and uh, spent about six weeks in the Whittington Psychiatric Hospital, which was kind of. Exciting, I have to say, at the time. <laughs> um, it was uh, really a really interesting experience, and uh, I'm actually making a documentary about that um, next year. Uh, a really interesting experience, uh, to, and I'm in, in some ways glad that it did, because it just got rid of a lot of crap. And now I don't have any of those worries and fears, and I'll just get on with it. So I'm going to jump forward to just before Homeland. We know that you had that noise at the ATM. <laughs> and then you got this huge role. Tell me about that and how you felt about that. Because you didn't actually read the script at first, right? Did you turn it down or Again, didn't even want to read it? It's, it's My research on point. <laughs> no, yeah, it is actually. I'm very surprised. But I mean, I am really... I'm going to be very honest with you guys. But um, I, ha I used to have this really good friend of mine, Louis, Italian guy. And... Uh, he was the one person who always said, I'm going to make it. He was my rock. Whenever I got down, I'd ring him up and say, I'm getting a bit down. He'd say, Dave, don't worry about it, man. You're going to make it. He absolutely was convinced of it. And uh, in 2010, it was my daughter's birthday, and um, just went back to walk out the door and go for a pizza. <clears throat> and I got a call, and he was dead. Um, just out of the blue. My best mate ringing, rang him every single day. And if there's one thing that's destroyed me, it's that. I was just broken. And um, I couldn't work. I couldn't act after that for about 10 months. I couldn't get my head together. And um, I, I was really, I really thought, I, I, you, you, it, it takes a lot to get up on stage. It takes a lot to go to an audition and and do you know you, you think it's easy but it's not you really need a lot of confidence and when that confidence is gone it's tough and I, I couldn't do it I just didn't have the confidence to go into the room and after about 10 months of not working and just kind of staring at the floor and feeling you know like all was lost um, my agent sent me uh, the Homeland script and he said he said look I know you're not you know, you know, you're not at your best, but you know, you should really put your put yourself on tape for this because this is going to be an absolute winner. I know it. I said, no, I don't want to do it. I just haven't got, I haven't got it. I just, I haven't got the confidence. And he said, just put yourself on tape. So um, after turning it down twice, he then rang me up and said, David, please. He said, they, they really want to see your tape. Can you just put yourself on tape and send it to me? So I. I got my phone, because I couldn't afford a camera. I got my mobile phone and I stuck it on the windowsill. That was the only place, that I was, I'm so black, that was the only place that you could see me. <laughs> so I stuck it on the windowsill and I just read, I read the Homeland script like this, like this, just reading it like this, in this terrible American accent. And uh, sent it, didn't think anything, just didn't think anything else of it. And about a month later, uh, I got a call 
from my manager saying, you are this close to getting Homeland. I said, what's Homeland? I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> he said, do you remember the thing I, you put yourself on tape? I went, oh yeah, yeah, that thing. I said, I said so what's, why, why, why am I that close? Why have I not got it? And he said, he said, well, you know, the tape wasn't that great because it was on the phone. So I said, well, I'll do it. I'll do it again. I'll do it properly. So I did it again. I did it properly. And um, again, about three weeks later, um, sitting at home, and I just get this email from my agent saying, congratulations. And I kind of went, about what? So I rang him up, and he said, you've just got Homeland. And I looked, no, I swear to you not, I looked at my wife and I said, I fucking got it. And she started tearing up, and I, and I and looked, so she said, do you know what day it is today? Well, no, she went, it's Louis's birthday. Oh. On his birthday, mm. a year later, I got it. And I have not stopped working since. Wow. Not stopped working since. Louis's got your back. So, <laughs> so he might not have seen it. He might not have seen. He might not have seen it, but I, I, you know, he definitely had my back, and that's probably the best thing. That's to get a job like that when I was that low and that down. I think is crazy. And I'd, I'd say to you, if one say one thing to all actors, I know, you, or young actors, say if if you can just turn up. You know, if you've got an audition and you don't feel like going, just get in the room and, and give it your best shot because you just never know. You just never know. So I was saying to it. David before we came out here that um, having done quite a few of these interviews now, it always seems that the story kind of goes when people think that it's time to give up. I mean, you said you wanted to be a lorry driver at one point, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> he was I mean, going to be a lorry driver. That's was, when to keep was, going. There was, we always used to say, there's a, you know, we, that's a joke, there's, there's always work at the post office. And, and you, know, I, you know, I literally was like thinking, oh, maybe I should go and be a postman. Or maybe I should go and do something else. Yeah, so I was, I was lucky that uh, from having no money and 80 quid and being down to literally six months later being at the Golden Globes and at the Emmys, seeing Pacino, De Niro, and DiCaprio, and all the other O's, and, um, <laughs> you know, it was just literally amazing, it was amazing to, to kind of go from that position to the, you know, the Golden Globes, it was crazy. So you've been very well received in America, as you just said, um, and uh, you spent quite a lot of time there and quite a lot of time in Canada. Uh, what I wanted to know, though, is you've mentioned before in the press about that you don't necessarily think the American black actors are that happy that the British actors are doing so well over there. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm sure you are in the know and we want to know. Well, they, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Is it a problem? It's a, it's a struggle for... A, I mean, I can kind of see their point, you know, I can kind of see, you know, it's a shame that they see it that way, but there are so few parts anyway for black actors over there that now all of a sudden all those choice parts are going to British black actors. John, Daniel, me, you know, so, so, <laughs> Idris, you know, I mean, and, they, and, and all of a sudden they don't like it. All of a sudden they're now kind of starting to kind of, you know, turn their nose up and you know, what are you doing stealing our, our jobs? And I kind of say, well, they're not your jobs, they're just jobs. You know, I said, so how come you can, how come Morgan Freeman can go to Africa and play Nelson Mandela? They're not African roles, they're roles. How come, what's his name, can play Idi Amin? And, and he's another African. I said, they're not necessarily African stories or African roles, they're roles that should be played by somebody who can play them. So I don't, I don't see it like that. And I'm it's very kind of honest the point about of it. acting, right? I was very <laughs> honest about it. And they didn't like what I said. I mean, Who's I, they? Well, I, 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 I don't, <laughs> know, you saw, I don't know whether you saw the uh, piece or, or you heard about what um, uh, Samuel L. Jackson said. And I read that and I was really not happy about it. So I wrote a response to it in The Guardian. He said, and I quote... You've got the American black actors not too happy with us playing American roles. It's unfortunate, but at the end of the day, talent will out. I don't think you can stop it. <laughs> yes. And, 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 I, and I would say that it's not just talent. It's the fact that um, I do think that um, British black actors 
have uh, we've just got a different experience of life, and m many of us tr many of us are really well trained, which they don't necessarily do in the states. You know, um, it's it, the whole the whole culture of acting is very different in America, with the emphasis being on you know you don't you don't you don't you just want to be an actor, you want to be a star, and we just want a lot of us want to be actors, and you know we want to act, we want to play these roles and. The fame part of it is a bonus. I'm not doing it for the fame. I'm doing it because I want to. I want to play these roles, and I, and I think they they're a bit surprised by that. They're not they're not as comfortable with that because I don't have a an, an agenda in the industry. I just want to do the work, and also I do think that they have a very they've been having spent time there. You know, they have been brought up in a very different political system, a very much more aggressively racist system. So it's very difficult for them to be objective about their colour. Whereas I think as British people, we can be, particularly when it comes to our characters. It's, I'm, I'm not playing the black chief of police, I'm playing the chief of police. And, but in America, you're playing the black chief of police because it's so ingrained in them. Race is so ingrained in the American story that it's very difficult for them to take that and put it aside. And um, I think we do, and the, which is what, what, which is what uh, Sam was saying. Uh, he said, I'd rather see a real American brother do that. Because a real American might be a little bit more aggressive or might, might, have, been, might have been a little bit, might have played some of those gags differently to what Daniel did. But Dan, I can understand that Jordan Peele, when he saw, Jordan Peele didn't want a black British person to play that role. But when he saw Daniel's tape, he was blown away by it because Daniel just played the character. He didn't have an agenda. There was no racial agenda there. He was just himself. And I think, uh, of all things, I think that's one of the things that I think Americans find a, bit, a, a little bit difficult is that we don't have that agenda. And um, that's why we're getting, not why we're getting work, but I think directors particularly see that and kind of go, oh, that's interesting. There's, I'm seeing a character, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing all the baggage and not say that it's baggage, but um, I'm seeing something that's genuine and authentic. No ego. Yeah. Right, I could just talk to him all day, but that's really selfish of me. So I'm going to open up the questions to you guys now. So uh, we haven't got loads and loads of time. So I'm please... not making any sense to you guys. Are we? <laughs> so please do just raise your hand the second you've got a question. I'll try and get the mic out to you. Hi, David. Hey, hi, hi, how you doing? Um, I have a question based on what you said about being in between jobs coming from so much success. Do you have an advice for young actors who may be in between jobs or don't know where the next job is coming from? How None of us know where the next job is coming right. from. Right. How do you how do you work on your craft and keep your resilience in the meantime? Do you think? Um, it's interesting. We, you, it's hard to kind of always continue. I mean, I've got to a point now, I mean, I'm 52 now, so I don't necessarily need to, to there's a lot of stuff I don't necessarily yeah. need to, to do, but uh, because I, you know, I've just done it, been doing it for so long. But if anything, I would you know, try and keep in the gym, try and keep yourself sharp, try and keep yourself fit, try and keep yourself healthy. Um, read, uh, try and um, keep up on, on, um, on what's happening you know i think it's just i think it's really really important to keep yourself fit and healthy mm. so that's how i would work on working on my body and working on myself is working on my craft as far as i'm concerned so <clears throat> i would keep trying to try and keep myself as sharp and as fit as, as i can I'm trying to write i'm trying to write now i'm trying to trying to um write books i'm trying to write right. um um you said you had a documentary yeah i'm doing another I, I did a documentary a couple of years ago about black prime minister and i um i've done one on failure which if you see there's a great documentary on sky about failure how it's not people think failure is the op opposite of success and it's not it's a part of success no actor that i know has had a career that's gone like that nobody they go like that and what you have to do is manage that. And when you have that low time, just try and keep yourself strong. And I guarantee you, as I found, it is in your lowest points 
that's when you learn a lot of shit. Mm. It is when you fail, that's when you learn shit. When you succeed, you kind of go, oh, that worked. Okay, great. You don't really learn anything. But when you fail, you really look at it and you go, okay, what happened there? What did I do wrong there? Well, maybe that was one. And you examine it. So I think failure is, is an integral part of what we do. The downtimes are an integral part of, of your story. So I would, I would urge you to not dismiss the difficult times, but really learn from them. And I wouldn't say it's, they're hard to enjoy. I'd maybe endure. And if you can get through it, I guarantee you when you have that uptime again, you'll just feel great because you know you've had the strength to get through it. Great, thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned that you thought that there were more roles in in Hollywood for black men, men as opposed to younger people, as women. well as sorry, and and women, and women. but also that it being more um, more politically, politically racist. Yeah. And I was wondering how you think that tension emerges. How is it that Britain is you think sort of less aggressively racist, and yet there's also less opportunity for black actors? Well, we don't have the numbers here for one thing. You know, I think in America you have a higher population of of, of black people. You have you've had years of the black church. You've had years of black institutions, black universities. So we're, they're far more ingrained into American culture, and they have fought hard to to get their success. So so I, I you know I remember the first time I did the, I did a theatre job in Houston, Texas. Um, they said, oh, they said, oh, you're going to go and open a bank account to, 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 for us to pay you. So I went to the local bank and I, I walked in and they said, oh, you sit in that room and I'll send the bank manager along. I'm sitting in this room. After about 10 minutes, this young black girl walked in and she said, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm just waiting for the bank manager. She said, yeah, that's me. And I was like... And she saw the look on my face and she said, have you never seen a black bank manager? I said, No. She was, she was like 22, and it was, I just thought, wow, look at that, you know. The, I think in America, as I say, I turn my TV on, there's black sheriffs, black policemen, black lawyers, black mayors, black, it's right through the system. They fought for it, but they've got it. We still don't have that here. We still are still only 3% of the population, three, three and a half percent of the population of, of Britain. So it's much more difficult for us to, to, um, uh, to, for, it's much more difficult for, for us to, to, to get along here because we've got to, particularly in television, because you go to the BBC, you've got to filter your way through, you know, it's, it's very middle class. It's very Oxbridge. It's very Cambridge. It's very, it's very alien to us still. And they still slightly look at us as, not say a problem, but they don't quite know what to do with us. Um, so, as I say, when I when you become a, a man, mature, there's just very few. You know, I remember sub stories of people saying to me, Tandy Newton, who's a fantastic actress. You know, when she a couple of years ago, the, she was playing. She went up for a, a role to play a surgeon, and there was a debate around the BBC whether a black whether they, a, a, a black woman could be a surgeon. It's kind of crazy. Not even, not, even, not even part of the conversation over there. There's a, there was a black president on TV in America before there was even a black president. They will just do it. In, in um, the Sherlock Holmes that they have over there, Watson is a Chinese lady. So they're, they're far more willing and open to, cut, for, to, cut, to, to be diverse, even though it's, it's a strange thing, but even though it's probably more racist, they're still, they're still um, and an urge to tick boxes. And I remember, again, first time I went to the States, I was just amazed to see, when I went, when I was first going, this was pre-Homeland, to go over there and see at the top of the, when you walk in the audition and you sign your name, at the top of, in big bold letters, please send more black actors. Please, we require more actors of ethnic minorities. I've never seen that here, never. They want to, they want, they, because they have to, they have to reflect America and the diversity of America. <clears throat> and for some reason that just doesn't happen here. I don't know why, 
it's still it's it's changing slowly, but it's still predominantly. Even now, I've been back two weeks. I haven't seen a single black actor on TV. Maybe that's just because of what I'm watching. But I, I couldn't go through the day in America without seeing a black face on TV in an authoritative central role. I don't see it here. So we've still got some catching up to do. <laughs> Hi, David. Hey. Torian still. Nice to meet you. How you doing, man? You know, I think it's important to introduce yourself, guys. Oh, Tori? So, you'd say you're Tori still? No, my name... <laughs> oh. Your name's Tori. Hey, Tori. Got him. <laughs> got him. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. My name... Speak, Dai. Speak, speak. ...is Torian Steele. Torian. <laughs> That's a fantastic name. Yeah, like thank you that. very much, man. Um, I like I've got a simple question. I've got a million questions, but I'm going to ask you one. Um, why train? Why train? Why train, yeah. Because I think there'll come a time or, an, or a, a moment in your career when the training is useful. I'm not saying you have to train. Many people don't train. I mean, many people don't need to train. But for me, uh, I'm glad that I did because vocally in, in the theater, I played, I love working in the theater. I'm not, I'm not just in it to be the movie star. I, I love acting. So I love walking into a theater and the, of 3,000 seat theater and being able to hit the very back of the theater with my voice. I love that. I love, I love that I can be intimate in a big space. And I love that. I love the craft of acting. So, and for that, that's, I had to train my voice for that. Uh, physically, I'm very aware of myself physically. I know and if I'm sitting on stage like that, it's very different to if I'm sitting on stage like that. So I'm, I'm just, it, those are the, just the little nuances that, it's very basic, but there's little nuances that training gives you. Training gives you the ability to work on different text. You know, I mean, if, if I gave you a film script, if we, we were working on a film script right now, uh, because I've trained or because I know how to break that script down, I know what I'm looking for in the script. I know to look at what, the, what everybody else says about my character. What are the words, what are the little words that people, that people say is domineering or is brutal or is, is hateful? You just, I know how to under, go through the script and work, look at all the things that people say about my character and then put all that on one page and look at all those words and I know how to create a character out of that. So there's only little, there's little nuances that, that I personally love that where my trainings benefited me. You don't have to. Some people are just naturally gifted. You know, I mean, I think I'm naturally gifted, but I, I'm glad that I've done the training to be able to get the natural talent out. And perhaps if you haven't trained, maybe there's only one thing that you, you can do. Uh, or, or maybe there's, maybe you're just gonna play, you're, maybe there's you're yourself. I don't wanna play myself. I, I know who I am, but I wanna play gangster, I want to play the bad man, I want to play the king, I want to play the prince, I want to play and I think you need a bit of training in order to be able to, ch to metamorphosize, to change yourself, to look for the difference and the nuances but you don't have to do that Thank you man Hi David mate, you alright? Hi um, I've got a question, especially with your time in America um, kind of like a, kind of just overall kind of question about diversity when it comes to disability and the kind of exposure in there do you think america's a bit too purist in the terms of like allowing disability to to kind of get into the the folds a bit is there is there any signs from your kind of viewpoint that you've had inside the industry and also over here in britain that you think uh disability has a kind of part to play because you know disability is kind of weird because it's the only minority that have, includes all of the others so um, you know, so. it's it's inter interesting point. It's an interesting point. I mean, I literally just saw a piece on the news here yesterday. They're doing some production in the West End, and they want. <clears throat> I mean, there's a character that's in a wheelchair, and they are the director has decided that he's going to audition people who are in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. and I, I, again, that's that's. I think it's beginning. It's starting. I think people are now. Yeah, sorry, it's funny. What I think one of you said, like. Um, you mentioned like uh, when you when things were coming up, like uh, there were lampshade roles or something. Someone always needed a lamp, but now now it's like ramp roles because every kind of needs a ramp. Because yeah. I've yeah. noticed yeah. like being being a disabled actor myself, um, 
they always want people in wheelchairs, but there's more disabilities than just. Well, well look at the guy. In, the guy yeah. in Breaking Bad is a, there's a, yeah. a great character in Breaking Bad, and there was no reason for that character yeah. to be to be disabled. Yeah. But it added a, a wonderful element to it. Yeah. So I do think that the industry is slowly opening up to that. Um, yeah, with trans actors, it's opening up. So I, it, it's it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an exciting time right now. I think because whereas before it was just straight white man, straight white woman, the industry is starting to change a little bit now, and it's it's it's, it's those stories are being told uh, far more. Far widely, far much, much more widely than they used to be told. So, yeah, I, I, maybe we're maybe we're maybe a couple of years away. And what it, wouldn't it be wonderful to be a couple of years away from a disabled person winning an, winning an Oscar? You know. So me. Yeah, you. I mean, why why get Daniel Day Lewis to play a disabled person when you could get a disabled person to play a disabled person? Yeah. So you know, I th and I, I I don't think that's gonna be. I don't think that's too far away. Thank you, David. Quick question. Um, so for a young black actor like me, yeah. what advice would you give like, in terms of like, making the industry better in the UK? For a young black actor like you, I would just say, um, bring, all, bring all your energy into it. <laughs> and bring all your energy into it and, and, and bring your natural gift, your natural talent into it, bring your attitude into it because Again, in my day, they were a little bit scared of us because they didn't really know how, how, how to handle us. But I think you guys are just coming up. You've got so much confidence and, and so much energy that it doesn't necessarily have to be... You don't necessarily... I had to conform to a certain extent. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, I came out of... You know, back in my day, as I say, it was much more about uh, theatre and, you know, and... and, and and the tradition, whereas I don't think you guys have to conform anymore. You don't have to, I had to cut my hair short. I had to wear my hair a particular way. I had to kind of, I, did, I couldn't rock the boat. But I think you guys are coming in so fresh and so so natural that I would, I would say, don't conform. Just be yourself and just blast away, man. Blast away. And, but don't be deterred either. You know, I think it's, you're going to, there's a lot of rejection in this business, a lot of rejection, um, but don't take it personally. Um, don't think you have to change because of the, you're not getting where you want to get to. Um, hopefully, there'll be a different. There'll, there'll, you know, there'll be. There's a writer up there. There's a filmmaker up there. There's a there's a producer down here. You know, that uh, you know. Look, I mean, there's just sort of four great short films there, and um, there seems to be. A change in the industry that is uh, that is um, allowing people to be themselves, and I think that's again tremendously exciting. So, if anything, I, I don't know if I'm asking your question, but don't conform. Don't feel you have to conform. Right. Don't feel you have to change. Just be yourself. Okay, give me, give me, give me two. Give, give me uh, shout your questions out, and I'll answer them. Go on, shout your questions. One up there, yes. Yeah, even more so, even more so. And Denzel said that. Denzel said, you know, it's it's white white men, white women, black men, black women. It, 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 but listen, Viola Davis blowing the place apart in America now, you know. So it's taken her a long time to get there. But now everyone's like, wow, she's incredible. So I would say, keep going, keep 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 pushing, don't be deterred, and um, keep you know just keep on. Go on, one more. I'm gonna wait for you to kick me out. Go on, more. Net, this is the last one. <laughs> What was my big, biggest revelation? <laughs> biggest revelation as an actor. The fame ain't all it's cracked up to be. Trust me. It's it's it, it's um, it's not. It's uh, when when you're trying to buy some sausages in Sainsbury's, and somebody comes up to you and goes, "Idris, I love your work." Oh. <laughs> oh no. And then you go. You, and then you go. Oh, I'm not Idris. They go. You are. No, I'm not. You are. It's Idris. It's Idris. It's the most annoying fucking thing on the planet. So, and then you just kind of wish you were just Joe Bloggs because because there's nothing more annoying than people thinking you're not being Idris. You're not being Idris. <laughs> <laughs> one more, one more, one more. Oh right, last that's one, it. last one, last one. <laughs> 
Nothing. What? Nothing. I wouldn't do anything differently. Because my journey has been my journey. It's taught me everything I know. And I would not change anything. The pain has led to revelations. And all the revelations have led to... All of it has been worthwhile. All of it. Even the, the, even the, the tough bits. Trust me. They all build to something. I'm taking them. I'm taking them. <laughs> my school was doing a diploma for the second year running ever called Creative Media Diploma. So after getting rejected from the Brit in music twice, um, I did um, sort of, I did the Creative Media Diploma instead of like choosing options like French, Spanish, etc. 